complete evacuation now. Would you look at that? That sounds much better. This was indeed one of the worst sequel movies, but I actually liked it. It starts off really stupid and cringy because you think you're looking at a xenomorph, but as the camera starts to zoom out, you realize that you're actually looking at some kind of bug. What kind of freaking bug looks like that? Really? I mean, maybe it's a space bug or something and bugs evolve to have freaking alien teeth, but apparently it's a space thing. The bug is not the problem. It's what happens to it that makes me freaking gag. It's just chilling out there with its freaking alien claws and then out of nowhere it gets squished and the nasty ass guy just looks at it and tries to flick it like an idiot. And then he's like, let me look through my straw and then stroke it on there and put it right there and then blow on it, which is so freaking disgusting. I don't I don't know why they even added that scene. It's really freaking nasty. It gets on my nerves. I hate it. Did you also notice how the idiot put his mouth on the end where the bug guts were? Might as well have eaten it. Why didn't you? You ever watch certain scenes from movies and they just irate you beyond understanding? That's what this intro did. Anyway, the events of the movie are set 200 years after the events of the last movie, Alien 3. And we know how much everyone loved that movie. I actually enjoyed it, while acknowledging that it was a piece of crap movie. I got another surprise for you. This movie is not the best either, but it's also another movie that I enjoyed. This part makes no sense, because apparently they cloned Ripley, and the clone's arms always look like she's posing, like she's a darn stigmata. Apparently she just grows with her arms always stuck in this position. Anyway, this specific clone of Ripley, which they're calling Ripley 8, is being operated on. The whole reason they even do this is to experiment taking the chestburster out of someone through surgery. And voila, they are successful. Well, look how cute and ugly it is at the same time. The lead scientist guy here reminds me some what of the green goblin guy, William Defoe? Just like from this angle, I don't know. You may be wondering how they got Ripley's blood in the first place. Well, from the last movie, when she had crashed down on that prison planet, they had taken blood samples, or at least the doctor did, before she died. And since she had the queen alien in her body the entire time, I guess that's actually plausible. I know some people had an issue with that, and I think it's just the way it was executed, but it actually makes sense that the doctor would take blood. But I guess the alien parasite being a part of her body and nothing being off didn't set off any alarm bells or anything. But they could explain that away too because they said that they have minimal stuff there and almost none of their machinery works. So they were literally living with the bare necessities. And what's even more interesting is that because the queen was a part of Ripley and the queen xenomorph that was inside her, her DNA combined with Ripley's DNA, well, the clone that they get from Ripley, anyone that they use, is going to grow up naturally with an embryo inside of it. I don't know why. And I don't know why I just started talking like that. Freaking having a stroke over here. So they successfully take the embryo out of Ripley and keep her for study. Look, Ripley has really bad, dirty fingernails. So that means that she's part alien. Just as the xenomorph gets genetic information from its host, so does Ripley, now that she survived the whole ordeal, get genetic modifications or information from the alien. See, I always thought it was just the xenomorph embryos that took on the DNA of the human host. I had no idea that the human hosts would get a little bit of that genetic information. I guess the same thing happens with babies, so I don't know. After all, this is an alien species that we're talking about. So what's exciting about this is that Ripley gets super strength and a whole bunch of other wonderful things you're gonna make us all very proud maybe you shouldn't be all up in her space with her legs open just saying you were a little bit too close not the kind of bedside banner that i would call classy so discount thor the god of thunder over here gives her a bolt of electricity and sends her flying off the dock or head scientist or whatever they're about to kill her but the doctor's like no don't my work ripley is now tied up and they teach her a whole bunch of things honestly she says this is a hand. I honestly thought that's what it was. I honestly looked at it and I was like, is it a freaking baby hand or something? It looks like a hand to me. I don't know why glove wasn't my first answer. So when Ripley said hand, I was like, don't, don't worry, Ripley. First thing that came to my mind too is that. When Ripley is shown the girl cartoon or girl picture thing, she gets all sad. And the amount of times people say Ripley's name in this movie makes me feel annoyed on her behalf. Ripley, 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 what is it? Ripley. Ripley. Hey, Ripley. Good memory. Ripley's back, man. Is that it? Ripley! Ripley, Ripley, come on. Ripley, don't. Ripley? Ripley! Ripley! 
honestly would lose my mind. So the scientist, this weird guy who I absolutely love as a villain, because he's not exactly a villain, this guy who reminds me of some kind of Italian Jewish uncle is like, what about her memories, dude? Because apparently this Ripley has memories from the real Ripley. And he's like, why does it have memories, bro? Their answer for this is because Ripley is now connected to the Xenomorphs, because since the Xenomorph embryo was a part of her, and the Xenomorphs are kind of like a hive situation going on, not only did Ripley inherit strength and other stuff from the Xenomorph, but also memories. More specifically, genetic memory, which is what the Xenomorphs have. She also has a psychic link with the Xenomorphs and acid blood as well. One thing I thought about that is like, you know, I always think about some really awkward things. What if Ripley, in this body as a clone, not ever having had the love of someone physically, if you get my drift, is making love with someone and her thing breaks and she bleeds on that person's peen. Like, what happens there? You know what I'm saying? Like, he gets corrosive acid on his dick and now, you know, he's dickless. God, it's like she's destined to be alone. Now I understand where that weird concept with her doing the Xenomorphs came from. Somebody told me that. That was actually a scene that was cut or an idea that was cut from the movie. Would have been pretty weird if he had that in. Anyway, this is why she was sad earlier because of that genetic memory. Her seeing the picture of a little girl, it reminded her of Newt. You know, the little girl that got killed off in the last movie? Yeah, her. Ripley doesn't know why it makes her sad, but she knows that it's important. Now, there is a lot of awkward exposition here, kind of magic school bussy and Michael Crichton-ish, but for me, it's just an expansion on the lore, so I don't really mind it. I do acknowledge that it skeeves the spine listening to the way it's delivered, almost like we're watching a cartoon or something, but it does give you more insight into how the aliens work. Emotional autism, certain reactions. Oh, oh, oh wait a second. It has memories. Why does it have memories? Inherited memories passed down generationally at a genetic level by the aliens like its strength. It's hilarious because the scene is meant to give us some backstory into what's going on scientifically in layman's terms so that people can understand exactly why Ripley is the way she is and why she's doing what she does and acting the way she does because if it didn't do that, nothing would make a lot of sense. And I guess in the way they would do this is talking to the military officer who's in charge of the whole operation because, you know, from the first time we were introduced to these aliens and the crews and stuff, we knew that the companies out there were trying to militarize these things. So now they're actually getting to do it, you know? This is essentially Jurassic World where they have the park under control. That's exactly what these movies are. It's freaking crazy. If you think about it, the alien movies almost mirror each other in their concept. The whole life finding a way and people getting too close to something they think they can control but they actually can't. Then it blows out of proportion and people think they get away but life finds a way again. And people keep rinse and repeating the same things over and over again. <laughs> Seriously, watch all the Jurassic Park movies, especially the first three, and the first three alien movies kind of line up with those Jurassic movies. And the resurrection lines up with Jurassic World. Because you actually thought, oh, this is what a working park looks like. This is what a working lab looks like if they actually got the aliens under control and then they just go out of control again. An unexpected benefit from the genetic crossing. Oh, 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 oh I see. What? Oh, stupid me. Right. Uh, of course, an unexpected benefit of the genetic process. How? I didn't even think of that. Why was that needed? Like, why was that needed? That was so freaking uncomfortable to watch and listen to. It felt like I was watching the Mario and Luigi movie all over again, the old one, where everyone acts like that because it's just a normal way for those characters to act or something because everyone during that time period acted like that for some reason. Ripley looking like Michael Jackson throughout this whole movie. Well, the military leader guy is like, look, my only issue is I hope that because, you know, she has memories or it has memories as she calls him he calls her, that she doesn't up and decide she wants to just get rid of the Xenomorphs because the original Ripley wanted to do that. We can also see that they have raised the queen that they took from Ripley. At least I'm guessing this is the queen they took from Ripley. And she is chained up and forced to lay eggs. The whole idea is that this lab is studying these Xenomorphs and they're also breeding them in an attempt to study them and control them. It's the only reason why they're keeping Ripley 8 alive. And just like with Eleven from Stranger Things, around this time you're guessing that Ripley's number 8 at the end of her name means that she's probably the eighth iteration of her kind, meaning the eighth clone. At dinner, she asks the one weird scientist, like, where she came from. He tells her, you died on Fiori and we had your stuff on ice. And she's like, you know, you know, I had a queen inside of me. She's gonna breed and you guys are all gonna die. The lead scientist guy with his long ass face is like, oh, we got everything under control, little two teeth. We're gonna militarize them. You see what I'm talking about? Same thing with the Jurassic Park movies and militarizing the dinosaurs. Except that in this movie, it actually makes better sense why people would want to militarize 
miniaturize something like this because they breed very fast and they're very hard to kill and they freaking acid as blood and they're intelligent. Dinosaurs and that's like their only thing. So the concept doesn't work for that, militarizing dinosaurs, when in that world they already had technology that was loads more advanced than freaking dinosaurs that you have to spend a lot of money on and feed. Just saying, one makes sense for the creatures to be militarized, aka alien, one doesn't, aka Jurassic Park. The animal itself, potential. Unbelievable, once we've tamed them. <laughs> so he says the potential of these creatures is unbelievable once we've tamed them. To which Ripley scoffs at him and does this whole retort and honestly, the way that he comes back at her is kind of fun. Because they always make these guys look really stupid and mind you, they are. But his comeback was kind of hilarious and she had nothing to say. The moment I saw that, I remember I first saw that I was like, oh shoot, burn. You walked into that one, Ripley? You can't teach it tricks. Why not? We're teaching you. Shortly after, we get a mercenary ship and we're introduced to Elgin, his girlfriend. Yes, we have my tats. Call, played by Renona Ryder, and the most likable character, Vries, who is paralyzed from the waist down. He obviously likes Call, and there is a scene in there where he's nervous to tell her a joke. The first time I saw this, it made me gag. The second time I saw it, it evoked the same feelings, but I had better self control this time. What has two thumbs? One eye, pink tongue, and screws like a god. What? Oh my god. Oh no. Oh god, did you spend like a week working on that, bro? Because that is not it. God almighty, dude, stop. The embarrassment. I'm getting like second and third hand emba embarrassment. Is it second hand? No, because he's not actually there. So is it third hand embarrassment? Because you know, he's in the movie and we're all watching. God. I do like Christy and Jonner, the one who acts like an animal. He's very annoying, but he becomes humble later on for a very nice reason. <laughs> So like I said, he's paralyzed from the waist down. So Jonner thinks that it's funny to throw a knife in his leg, which could actually get infected and still kill him. Or maybe those aren't his actual legs, but I think they are. After Call scolds Jonner for his antics and he acts like a bully, the ragtag crew docks into the main spaceship, or specifically space station. They're pat down and scanned for weapons. Jonner's like, I'm just carrying a thermos. And Vree's chair goes off too, but he's like, you wanna check my chair, it's fine. Money is exchanged from the the military guy. And then we have a whole scene with Elgin here on the left talking about Call, the girl played by Winona Ryder, and how barely fuckable. She is. Look at his freaking face, bro. Ew, look at his face. He looks like Mr. Centipede from James to the Giant Peach. Don't they look alike? <laughs> down to the nose. Oh, come on. They do. Admit it. Look how alike they look. That is uncanny. It's freaking weird. And yes, I am ashamed to say that I had a crush on Mr. Centipede. But don't blame me because Mr. Centipede had way more charisma than this guy does. I'm gonna take a wild guess here, General. But I'm so the first time I was watching this, I had to watch it over three times. So like, what is he doing? And apparently in the future, people can make certain drinks out of solid material. I found that really interesting. They have a laser thing that basically breaks it down and makes it into alcohol. Dude, he looks like, look, he's even smoking the cigarette like Mr. G Giant Peaches. It's crazy. The general guy's like, what do you want? And he's like, just, you know, a place to stay for two days and a bed and whatnot before we sail off again. And the colonel, general, whoever the frick he is, agrees to it as long as they don't make any trouble for him and his people and not go in the restricted areas. You can bet someone's gonna break that rule pretty fast. Meanwhile, in the restricted areas, we get this cargo that the Betty crew of mercenaries carry. They actually kidnap people from their cryo tubes who are in cryo sleep and brought them to these people to experiment on. They don't even know why. And these poor people, when they wake up, are met with a face hugger egg. What's interesting is that the two scientists on the right obviously don't like what's happening. The guy on the left, who is the lead scientist, could care less. So we switch over into a basketball scene with Ripley and... This scene has its moments. It is freaking weird. And yes, it does have a bit of awkwardness in it, but I don't know. I like this version of the clone of Ripley because they're trying to make her even badass. It's like she keeps evolving throughout the movies. In the last movie, she was badass, but in that movie, she was more badass. 
Now in this movie, she's badass supreme. But what we have to remember is that Ripley 8 is actually a clone of Ripley. She's an enhanced alien genetic engineered version. Of course, Jonner comes in. He's like, hey, let's have some basketball. And I know this movie sucks to a lot of people. And yes, it, it does have its issues, a considerable amount of them. It's very campy and weird. But I think the reason why I forgive it a bit more than other types of sci-fi movies is because it's kind of out there. You know what I mean? Like really out there. And they're still holding on to the tether of the main character in some way. Like the whole alien queen thing with a genetic inheritance. I can actually buy that because that's something I could believe because it's a freaking alien. It's easy to make up things when nobody knows anything about them. But because she has the alien genetic material in her DNA, she is a predator. And she toys with this really huge guy who's very intimidating and who's actually hired to hurt people. You got some moves on you, girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the way she's toying with him. You actually feel as though that poor man has no idea what he's messing with. And this is wonderful because we get to see her showcase her true strength against someone who is actually stronger than probably everybody on that ship. Come on now, give me the ball. So then Christy comes and he's like, you did not just hurt my friend. Are you insane? I think the only reason why he was like, okay, um, I'm gonna hit you with the full force of God himself because you were able to do that to him. So they probably thought that she was a weapon by the military or something. And I thought that this was a little bit overboard, maybe because I like Ripley. The guy takes up a freaking barbell and it's like, oh my God, she's Spider-Man. He's like, all right, let's play a game. Let me smush you in the face with a dumbbell. <laughs> I just... Oh my god, it's hilarious. Ripley's like, are you, what is wrong with you people? You obviously have no idea what you're messing with. To be fair, Ripley did strike the other person first. He didn't touch her. I mean, you know, that way. He was just being inappropriate, but he didn't put his hands on her. He wanted to play ball. And she was like, no, I'm going to I'm gonna embarrass you and provoke you. He could have just walked away. He was getting frustrated, but he didn't hit her. Now, if he had hit her, I'd be like, okay, he got what he deserved. But she's also a predator, and they made a showcase of this, so it's badass. Who didn't want to see Ripley part Z no more, if you know what I mean? So after Ripley beats him with the basketball, and everyone's like, oh my god, look how amazing she is. We get the cringy villain exposition of him coming down with a dumbass slow clap. It's so annoying when they do that. Ripley? Ripley. The hell are you? <laughs> Look how proud he looks. He looks like an idiot. Look at this guy's face. Oh my god. A human woman beat us like that. Something's wrong. No, but seriously, even if a regular grown man had done that, they would recognize that it's not normal. So then the other guy has to be like, she's something of a predator, isn't she? And then the lead science guy in all his pride and wisdom is like, yes, <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> my work. <laughs> Hard on. <laughs> What's interesting, as they pass by where she flicked her blood, Ripley's blood, even though it looks like human blood on the surface, is clearly corrosive acid like that of the xenomorphs. Maybe a little less and not as fast acting, but still a reason for concern. Ergo the question I asked earlier. Reese is doing something, he's up to some stuff. Meanwhile, our zany science guy checks on the sleeping xenomorphs and notices that the third one is a little bit too inquisitive for his taste. probably love this movie more than people would think normal and I loved it because we get to see more of the xenomorphs up close and they actually look decent. I don't know if those are live action models or something it looks like they are. How do they keep them constantly wet and gooey like that? Someone constantly pouring freaking oil over them? I don't know but it made me so intrigued and I think this was the movie where I actually started to really fall in love with them because I didn't exactly see the movies in order. I think this might have been the first movie that I watched maybe or the second I'm not sure. But my mom loved these movies and they would re-release them or rerun them and I would just watch clips of it as she was watching.
This alien does not like this guy toying with him. But the alien learns its lesson. This is also the first movie where we see that they are extremely intelligent. So the guy's like, you know what? I got, I'm gonna fix your business. Watch this. Look, look at this. What? Watch this real quick. Clack! And apparently, whatever it is he is emitting into that enclosure is very cold or very uncomfortable for them. When he's done, the alien is so angry that he goes to charge from him again, but stops when he sees the guy about to hit the button, which means that they are very, very intelligent, and they can put two and two together. As the guy says, they're fast learners. I never understood why she was trying to drink with stupid gloves on, and I could understand why Jonner and his friend got upset, but Cole uses this opportunity to go and find Ripley. Her whole thing is that she's supposed to kill her because she's aware that the aliens are inside of her, but she realizes that they got the alien out. This is where we get snarky Ripley. And I love this primal side of her, to be honest. Well, you gonna kill me or what? I don't know why she stares her talking to her, though, because it's clear that she's out of her depth. Ripley doesn't kill her, even though she was about to choke her. She's like, they're looking for you, bro. Call gets caught by the military, and they're like, what are you doing in the restricted areas? They get the Betty crew back together, and they're like, okay, so you have terrorists on board. Clearly, you were sent here for a purpose. Unfortunately, Call is the one that was doing this with Vries, who was still missing. When they realize that the military is going to kill all of them because they can't trust any of them, that's when our boy here, Christy's like, okay, my little plastic guns that I had built strapped onto my arms, I guess they're made of a different material which is why they weren't picked up he decides to use them and he is so freaking cool i love his character a whole fight breaks out the betty crew gets the upper hand and they're like call what are you doing bro while our zany scientist and his girlfriend are distracted the xenomorphs are like okay so here's the deal um little brother you're gonna freaking die we're gonna start chop chop chopping through your midsection so your guts fall out and we're gonna use your blood as the acid to burn through the ground so we can get out of here okay thanks this scene honestly broke my heart because you could tell the conversation that the xenomorphs are having with each other. <laughs> I'll show it in a minute. But the little one seems very upset because he doesn't want to be killed. It's like the others are telling him, look, it's just business. We will, you, we, we got to help the queen. You know what I'm saying? And uh, thank you for your sacrifice. And the other one is crying its four eyes out because it doesn't want to be eaten. And the other's like, it's okay. We, we got to do this. It's just, just let it happen. <laughs> feel so bad for him can you imagine your two friends are in there with you and your blood is like basically a weapon and instead of hurting themselves and you all making an agreement to like spit a little bit of it out you just kill each other but there's the inconsistency with this movie because later on one of the xenomorphs straight up throws up acid blood when it's getting attacked christy here is like what are you doing and i haven't seen it got hit and the xenomorphs like Ugh, and then spits out its acid blood straight at the guy's face and he gets burned up with the acid and that is very painful so if they have the ability to do that because i don't think this thing was shot why didn't the other ones do that in the freaking cage don't know. The unfortunate poor runt of the litter is like, oh no, I'm dead. The zany scientist realizes that something horrible is happening, and the xenomorphs are waiting for the acid to make a getaway down to where they need to go. His stupid ass goes in there with no weapons, and is like, let me stick my head all the way down there, and he gets dragged in. Very interesting that as you're looking at these creatures, you notice that their arms are webbed, which means that I'm guessing they're good swimmers as well. This soldier goes in after he notices the scientist was dragged down, and the aliens have escaped. And because the aliens are so freaking smart, when this lovely soldier is like, I'm gonna fix everyone, he gets one of the most horrible deaths. I don't know what the substance is, something that freezes everything and causes his body parts to become so cold that they just break off and his skin becomes burned till you can see his skull. And the alien's like, I win! Ripley realizes that something is wrong. Vries has a run-in with the aliens while Ripley tries to escape. Turns out that Vries had pieces of his fire weapon on his chair and he starts taking off the different pieces that actually make up his chair to assemble them into a big shotgun. Unfortunately, he finds out that the aliens have corrosive acid, but he's a badass. You never expect it because he's so sweet, but he knows how to handle himself, and that's the reason why he's on this crew. Ripley uses her corrosive blood, and you can see how strong she is being able to open up the steel containers
container. She shorts out the wires and is able to open the door. The place is in full panic and many of the military is trying to escape through the pods. Unfortunately, the aliens get to some of them. And these poor guys, when they're seat belted in, one of the xenomorphs make it in and kill them Jurassic Park style. Luckily, the general's like, nope, I'm gonna fix your business, bro. And it goes inside the hatch before they can take off and he detonates the grenade so that alien doesn't make it off. Unfortunately, he gets killed in the process in one of the most weird deaths. The alien eats him from behind and he like pulls off a piece of his brain and he's like, oh, what's this? Oh, 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 oh my god, a piece of my head this is. Oh dear me my, that's what it looks like. There's some bad actors that die very well, and there's some good actors that look like they're idiots while they're dying. I mean, there's no way to really look dignified while you're dying, you know, because that's kind of unfair to say. But I should say it looks more believable when some people do it. This part of the movie, in oh my god, it really makes me angry. Elgin, one of the lead guys, is like, you know what, the rest of my group is telling me to come along, but I'm going to tr choose an isolated cutoff corridor, cor corridor, I can't even speak, corridor to go to because I've seen clearly that some something is wrong here. We haven't seen these monsters. We don't know what they are, but there are guns lying down everywhere. There's drool everywhere and something feels wrong. I'm going to go off and not answer my friends when they're calling me. And instead of sticking with the group, I get eaten by a freaking alien. Good for your ass. His friends come back, but he's already dead. That's when they see the xenomorph for the first time. They try to run away but the door is locked and this scene of the xenomorph walking away here is so beautiful because it's the first time we actually see it and it's computer graphics or at least looks like computer graphics but looks like an actual alien and not somebody wearing a suit but it still looks practical enough just look at the beautiful creature before you look at the way it walks one thing i noticed like when i was little because i love dinosaurs and dragons i always thought this thing was like a combination between the two and i always marveled at how beautiful it looked yes i know surprisingly enough I thought xenomorphs were beautiful. Anyway, the xenomorph hears a weird noise and the body moves a little bit. And when it goes to the wound area, it's like, I see you. And then Ripley pushes the body off and she's like, all right, was it everything you hoped for? She's so snarky in this because she's a predator. And everyone's like, what in the world are you? They keep the lead scientist captive. And he says there are 12 more. Everyone's arguing amongst themselves. And the Ripley delivers this weird line that even one of the characters look at her and they're like, what the hell? So. Who do I have to fuck to get off this boat? That's so weird. Ripley rips out the tongue of the dead alien and gives it to Call and says it's like a souvenir. Call holds on to it and then is like, uh, no. So what, you didn't realize that she was giving you an alien tongue while you were looking right at it? You waited to touch it before you decided it was gross for you to be holding it? Okay. The crew sees Freeze after they thought he was an alien and they're happy to see him again. Everyone finds out from this military guy and the scientists that the ship is, uh, yeah, it autopilots back to Earth. That's why you can feel it moving and apparently Ripley's the one who felt it moving because, you know, she's an alien now, sort of. So she has, like, extra properties. And, like, you couldn't have known that because it's in stealth mode. But she notices it, and so does Call. Their idea is to blow the ship, but first they have to get off it. While they're trying to get away, Ripley finds a room where she sees genetic experiments with horrible, grotesque versions of the other clones 1 to 7, which were unfortunate, horrible results of them trying to clone Ripley from before. The crying that Ripley hears is another version of herself. She is being kept alive and is a complete pain. And just like with every single other movie that came before this, she's uttering to clone Ripley to please kill her. Please. Call gives her a firearm. What the hell is that? And feeling dismayed, and with this clone's approval, she's like, all right, I'll kill you. I'll blast you a flame because sure, burning somebody alive is the most humane way of killing them, not stabbing them in the brain or something. Or breaking their freaking neck, which, yes, that could lead in disastrous results as well. But stabbing him in the brain, how did you think b blasting them with fire was going to be better? Anyway, she wastes the ammo and blasts the fire throughout the entire lab. And I used to wonder, why did the glasses break so easily when she was doing this? And I think it's because of the temperature difference with the water or thing being used to keep them being so cold and the fire being so hot. After she's done, she almost kills a lead scientist. Call tells her not to, and she wasn't going to anyway. And then this character utters exactly what we're all thinking. What's a big deal, man? Fucking waste of ammo. Must be a chick thing. 
it's not a chick thing, it's a Ripley thing, because that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> we got all these aliens around that are trying to pick us off, and you're going to use fire and the ammo for it to burn down things that are already dead. Gotcha. The crew finds all the people whose uh, the chest burster had burst out of their chests, and uh, their eyes are all closed and they look like they're peacefully sleeping, which is probably not what would have happened if someone was in agony getting bursted out by some alien larva. Ripley finds somebody who's still alive. The guy screams in fright as they calm him down. Turns out he's carrying one of the stuff inside of him and he had no idea. This scene was also one of the more awkward scenes because they're just having a conversation instead of answering him to make him shut up. Nobody is saying anything to him and he keeps asking the same thing over and over again. What's inside me? Look, we can't just leave him here. I thought you came here to stop him from spreading. What's inside me? There's gotta be a process. Can you stop it? I got no time for that. I can't do it here. The lab is out of order. What's inside me? I could do them. Back of the head. Painless might be the best way. What's inside me? No, there's gut. Yeah, this goes on for a while. <laughs> it's so cringy. Oh my god. Just tell the poor man what's inside of him. Anyway, they only knew this because Ripley sniffed it on him and she was like, leave him. But they decide that this guy, since he can do the surgery, being a doctor and whatnot and a scientist, they would carry him along and hopefully if this new survivor, well, survives, the doctor would do surgery and get it out. If he lives. Ripley explains to him finally, you got a monster in your chest. That good enough answer for you? And he's like, who are you? And she's like, oh. Silly goose, I'm the monster's mommy. Like, damn, Ripley, it's not the guy's fault that he was taken against his will and impregnated by a freaking alien or you. In that way, you can tell that Ripley is partly human, but that side of her with the disregard to a host is there and a bleed over from the alien species. Poor Vries can't use his chair anymore where they're going, so they go like old times with him and his friend Christy where Christy carries him on his back. Seriously, Christy has to be really strong to be able to do that. But it's nice because Vries has his back, literally. They do a whole exposition thing where they let you know that some of the guns can fire underwater. The whole kitchen area is flooded, so the group has to hold their breath for like four minutes to crawl through the entire thing. The most I've ever held my breath for was two minutes. I would have been dead in this scene. I think one of the actors almost drowned, as a matter of fact, when somebody hit their head on something. Can you imagine being the paralyzed guy, though, where your life literally depends on the other person making it out alive? This was my favorite scene because it is the first time we see the xenomorph swim. Not only that, but we see that Jonner shoots out some kind of missile and the xenomorphs are smart enough to know to get out of the way. The other one didn't get out of the way because he didn't see it because the other one was in front of him. These xenomorphs are freaking awesome. And it's the way that they swim through the water. Not only are they elegant when they're walking on land, but they're also amazing swimmers. Unfortunately, this girl panics. I mean, she's losing so much air. And the xenomorph's like, tra -dee da dee da dee da I'm just gonna go really slowly and look at that ass. I'm gonna catch it. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. And then it gets her and grabs onto her foot and drowns her. The most wonderful scene in the entire movie is followed up by the most awkward sequence from Ripley where she's looking at this hat and she's like, wiggle, 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 wiggle. Um, yeah, okay. Frick was that? What was that for? Why was that needed? What was that? Anyway, the others can't get air when they go to the surface because the surface is trapped by some kind of membrane. I don't know how they are able to stay lucid with all the air that's coming out of their mouths as they were screaming underwater. Why are you doing that? This place turns out to be an egg chamber. When they make it in, they realize the aliens lured them into a trap. Face huggers come out and one goes on Ripley, but she is so strong that she's able to fight it off. Christy shoots a canister of something and it blows up all of the face hugger eggs. The alien is not happy about this. As the lead scientist guy gets to the area to open the door, he's like, I can't open it, give me your gun. And she gives it to him like a freaking idiot. And he's like, haha, you're too trusting. Pop goes the weasel and she dies. Oh no. Gotta admit, he's pretty smart. The alien realizes that these guys are a problem, and so it jumps up and goes after them. And for some reason, they are missing the alien that is right there. The xenomorph is like, uh, no, and spits out its acid onto poor Christie's face. I feel so bad for him because it looks painful. Jonner tries to help as the xenomorph grabs onto Christie's shoe, and it works and he's able to kill the xenomorph whose head pops open. What happens next is actually pretty funny, and I was laughing at it because I could see myself doing the same thing. <laughs> the poor spider's just minding his own business. <laughs> and this guy who's a badass and kills a xenomorph. <laughs> 
he gets up and sees a spider, and then instead of being like, oh, okay, whatever, he just shoots the spider. I cannot even blame him. Now, if it was a furry tarantula or something like that, no, I would not have. But the ones with their legs that are disproportionate to their bodies, like, you know, your body's just a dot, and then your legs are like freaking forklifts. No thanks. Unfortunately, the xenomorph is dead, but it still has a grip on Christy's body. Vries is slipping. I don't know why Christy is just hanging with all of his dead weight on the sky. Last time I checked, his arms weren't paralyzed. So what is he doing? Why is he hanging like there? You know, maybe he's trying not to move so that the other guy doesn't slip. But I'm like, am I the only person who can hyperextend my arms backwards? Like I would have been like, let me try to grab on or something or at least try to hook my feet or do something besides using all my dead weight to swing from side to side, making it harder for the person to hang on. This guy's such a good actor because you could see the moment, even though he's like blind in one eye now. But this is the moment when he is like, uh, I have to sacrifice myself. And one thing I don't understand, right? The xenomorphs have very corrosive acid blood. And we've seen earlier on in the movie where their blood is so corrosive that if it pools, it can go all the way and cut down layers of metal, especially when it's voluminous. Like when you have layers, not just a drop, but like a back shot after back shot. I don't know if I'm using that word correctly, but you get what I mean. You have a stream of it, right? That makes it more potent. So our friend here, when we look at his face, by all definitions, why does he just seem to have like a second to third degree burn on his face instead of the whole thing being eaten out? Like I would have thought that his skull and flesh would have been completely gone, you know, especially since it wasn't just like a few droplets that landed on his face. It was a stream of acid. The consistency is like way off when it comes to their blood. But oh well. This part is sad because Christy, his eye still works. I know Miraculous sacrifices himself to save his friend. Even Jonner is screaming no because Christy is his best friend and it was so sad. So he cuts himself and dives into the water and drowns because the Xenomorph is still hanging onto him and those things are really heavy. Then Sacre Bleu, the door opens and lets them out and it's cold. She's still alive. Turns out Vree's little girlfriend here is a synthetic because in the alien movies, you always need a synthetic. One of the things I absolutely love about them, because, you know, they at least stay consistent when it comes to that. You gotta got aliens, stupid scientists, you're in space or on a weird planet that's not Earth, and robots, alien movie, and Ripley. I don't know why this guy feels like he's been catfished. You'd think by now in the future, where synthetics are a normal thing, that it would be a little bit more acceptable for people to be attracted to something, regardless if it's a robot or not. You know what I'm saying? She's a toaster oven. Can we leave now? Yeah, you're chopped liver, bro. You're an incubator. Doesn't feel too good, does it? I actually half expected everyone to have a comeback with him. Because you have the nerve to insult someone when you were literally a hunk of meat carrying the parasite that can kill everybody else. Anyway, Cole, feeling disgusted with herself, uses her ability to basically hack into the ship and she sets it on a collision course with Earth, which apparently is a hunk of rock. And the way that the other characters talk about it doesn't seem as though they have to worry about lots of innocent people dying. This despite what anyone says. Rating systems offline, deceleration increase. Why does she have to read that out loud? The way that it's echoing, I know they're doing it because they're like, look, look guys, she's a robot. She sounds like a robot and she's talking in two different kinds of voices in a chorus so that we can show you that she's in fact a robot because no human can talk like that. But seriously, if you're doing this out loud, can't the other people hear you? Can't the guy who just betrayed you hear you as well? Ripley has that same face. So she also opens up all the doors to clear them in areas so they can get to where they're going. I think it's also important to note because the movie made it seem important that Call is one of those like, upgraded synthetics called Autons and people didn't like that they were so real. Think Westworld. And so they kind of did a recall, but she and a few other Autons got rid of their modems and they're like, no, we're free because we're people too. And they went into hiding, which is why no one knew she was a synthetic. Just in case anyone wanted to know, because the movie wanted us to know, because they spent a good amount of time with people making a big deal out of that. Their idea is that they can crash the ship into Earth and get rid of the alien. Like that ever stopped aliens from invading before? Emergency override in console 4 by V level 1. It's Ren. He's almost at the Betty. Oh, so you can talk in a normal voice. So why weren't you doing that a second ago while you're still plugged in, mind you, when you were doing all those things? I mean, was it really necessary to be all creepy Terminator-ish when you didn't actually have to be? This movie's freaking weird. I still love it though. So Ren, the lead scientist guy, is going to the Betty, which is the mercenary ship, to try and get out of there, which is where they were trying to go. And he's going to leave them on this hunk of rock or on this hunk of spaceship. He realizes something is wrong because everything kind of shuts down on him and he's like, father. Interesting that the computer's not mother. Father, where's the power drain? And then that's where we hear our friend. Father! Father! 
father's dead, asshole. Intruder on level one. All aliens, please proceed to level one. That was cute and hilarious to Ripley, and she's like, you got a mean streak. <laughs> Like me, let's bang. Look at how towering, look, like, look, seriously, look at how towering Ripley is over Winona Ryder. I know she was like five foot ten. Winona is five foot three. I'm five foot three. This is how small I would be compared to her. She's a freaking Titan man. It's amazing. I know it's something that the actor was insecure about growing up, but there really isn't no need to be insecure. Because I personally think tall people, especially tall girls, are very beautiful. Then again, that's just how animalistic mammal nature is. You always want and admire things that other people have. I'm short and small, so I always felt like I wanted to be big and tall. But I'm not, and I'm okay with that, because I can still fit in a washer. Yes, you all know my secret. I was a beast at hiding seek because no one expected me to be hiding in cupboards and washing machines and dryers. I would always fold myself up into the most ridiculous places that nobody would ever guess to look, and I no one ever found me. It was awesome. But I would hide in the insulation in the attic. Don't play with me. I'm the beast at hide and seek. No one has ever beat me yet. For real though, don't hide in insulation. It's really freaking itchy. Like washing it off makes it worse. I hate how she's like, why do you go on living, Ripley? How could you stand yourself? This part annoyed me because she's disgusted with herself being a synthetic. Why don't you ask yourself that question? What kind of stupid question is that? Why did you go on living? If you're so embarrassed to be a synthetic, why don't you self-delete? Anyway, since she's programmed to love the people of the Betty, those mercenary friends of hers, she just couldn't leave them. And when she and the other Autons had hooked into some kind of mainframe, they figured out what the government was doing with the aliens and that's why she tried to kill Ripley because for what she knew about the information that she had Ripley was carrying one of those things and those things killed lots of people anyway the group beelines for the Betty carrying their friend why does Winona ride her why does she run like a hobbit she just <laughs> she runs so funny I don't know why it just it just stands out to me. The other guy can't walk or run, but he runs more human than she does, if that makes sense. But Altiari, remember, she's not human. Yeah, but even in the movies where she is human, she still runs like that. It's adorable, though, because the awkwardness just makes it more funny. Ripley gets distracted, and Jonner takes out his frustration on call. This is some good character growth from him, because the only character growth we get from him is that he learns to be a little bit more humble when Ripley puts him in her place like a wolf. I have to draw you a schematic. <laughs> hey! <coughs> Want another souvenir? Of course he's not gonna mess with Ripley because he respects her now because she's the only person there and that he has ever met that can easily kill him and not break a sweat. And yes, it's clear that Ripley likes taking tongues for souvenirs. Anyway, like I said, Ripley gets distracted. She's like, she can hear the aliens are so close. She can hear the queen and feel that she's in pain and the aliens drag her down with them. There's like an alien orgy shit thing going on. I have no idea what's happening right now. They're all with each other in, in spirit and in flesh. Then when Ripley wakes up, she's being carried by a xenomorph and she's like, Oh, I love you. And this part is so cute. I don't know why I found this part so cute. When I was little, I watched this. I was like, oh, that's her boyfriend. I legit thought that when I was little because I'm freaking weird. I don't know why I would have thought that, but I did. Shut up. You thought that too. The group thinks that Ripley is dead as they head on the collision course with Earth. They get to their ship and that's where they find the lead scientist. And he's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to kill this thing. Even though they know that she is a synthetic, I think it's really, really awesome here. Despite the fact they were making fun of her for being one that they still value her enough as their friend to not want this guy to permanently delete her. At this moment, this guy starts dying. The chest burster starts coming out. Yes, it's ready. And this is the most badass scene because this guy, as he is dying, runs towards the lead scientist and beats him up. And then he holds him by his chest. And as a little alien is being born, his last act of kindness is to hold the guy's head right up against him so that the little xenomorph can burst through his skull. I don't even know this guy's name, but he was a freaking badass. They do the last thing it can do for him and shoot the xenomorph, killing him and, you know, the guy. And that was honestly so sad, but he went out like a champ. Hey, look, there's a zany scientist and he is kind of like crazy now, but he always was. Ripley wakes up to find out that the queen has evolved. The queen had developed a uterus and is giving live birth. Reason for this? Well, the genetic contamination from Ripley, she now had some of the same DNA that Ripley had because this is the queen that indeed came out of Ripley. So she has her baby, no more eggs. And this is honestly the sweetest moment as the queen xenomorph coos and loves her baby before it smells her and it's like, you're not my mom. Bitch, you're not my mom. I'm a Take off your mouth. And that kills the mother the queen for some reason. If your mouth gets slapped off your face, I don't think that's going to kill you. But maybe for them it does. No. no. 
And then the baby notices Ripley. And honestly, the little noises that it makes are so cute. I always thought it was endearing how it thought that Ripley was his mom. And I had hoped that over time, she would have learned to tame it because it's her child and she would have taught it to be nice. It's still a xenomorph by nature, so I don't think it would have like been totally tame. It's still a wild animal, but at least it would have listened to Ripley for as long as she was alive. baby is bonding with Ripley. It doesn't like that its sweet moment is being narrated. And it's like, um, excuse me, please kindly stop interrupting. Ripley runs as fast as she can. And because she's freaking awesome, she can jump really high heights and she lands on the ship. It's so cute to see how Johnner's happy to see her and is like completely submissive towards her. She's like the alpha now. She can fly the ship, but of course the hatch is left open. When Call goes to fix the hatch, she finds out that the baby is on board and closes it for her. It is shown that the baby Xenomorph has a hint of sadism. He likes to watch cute things in pain until his mother tells him to put it down. Actually, I think it's a her. It has tits. She's like, you're my baby. She cuts herself on her baby's teeth. Sorry, I think the baby's a boy, regardless if it has tits or not. Because her blood is acidic, she flicks it on the glass, which causes the suction to drive the baby towards the hole and into outer space. And it's so sad. I feel so bad for the baby. It doesn't know any better. It thinks that Ripley is his mom. And the look on his face when he's scared, he's He's looking to his mom to help him, to make him feel better. And it's really freaking sad. I feel so bad. Oh, look at his face. He's scared and he's like, mommy, please help me. I'm scared. What is that? Imagine being a newborn baby and you're having fun with your mom. That sounds weird. And all of a sudden, this big roaring noise that you've never heard before is heard, and it's sucking you towards it. And your mom is suddenly a far distance away. You would feel sad too. He's terrified, and all he wants in this moment is for his mom to hold him. Ripley has to fight her maternal instinct to save him, and the baby alien basically starts yelling, oh no, oh no, and I think at one point it says mama too, I'm not sure, but this is really horrible. Ripley apologizes to her baby. <laughs> Okay, it's fucking depressing. After the poor thing has a very painful death and gets sucked into outer space, the main ship with all the xenomorphs on it collides into Earth in a desert area. Meanwhile, Ripley and her friends enter the Earth's atmosphere, but they land peacefully on Earth. Call asks Ripley what they're gonna do next. She's never been to Earth before. And Ripley says, I don't know, I'm a stranger here myself. Because remember, this is Clone Ripley. And Earth is now a desolate region where there is like no life. And I wonder after 200 years, what animal life looks like, you know, those that had to quickly adapt and what life would be like on a planet like this that is now alien to them. And that's the end of the movie. It wasn't the greatest movie, but I honestly loved it. It's one of my favorite alien movies. I think that the sequel, the direct sequel to Alien was the best, but I'm one of those people who's like, you know what? I completely understand why people hated these movies. I'm like an upside down person when it comes to Jurassic Park and Alien. Funny because the two kind of mirror each other. You know, the hubris of man trying to control something that's uncontrollable, but the story kind of makes more sense for this. I give more allowances for the xenomorphs because they're already outlandish as it is. Dinosaurs were just regular earth animals. So more logic is applied to them. But with the aliens, the sky's the limit. So I guess that's why I forgive it a little bit more, but I am aware these movies had a ton of issues. It definitely was better than the last movie. I love that we got to see the aliens swimming. I actually cared for the characters, especially Vries, who thankfully makes it out alive. And I'm sorry, but the Xenomorphs look badass in this one. I think that this is the movie in which they look the best, in my opinion. Well, thanks for joining me on the journey. You know what's next? The prequels. Oh dear. I know those movies were nasty, but I enjoyed them too. And I was so sad when I found out that they were not going to be continuing it. I mean, why not? You only had the third movie to go. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulteriori. You ask, we answer.